culture changes, right? What people want to focus on changes. And what I learned is that it's okay to rebrand. It's okay to slightly adjust your topic if you need to. Most hosts never achieve the results they hoped for. They're falling short on listenership and monetization, meaning their message isn't being heard and their show ends up costing them money. This podcast was created to help you grow your listenership and make money while you're at it. Get ready to take notes. Here's your host, Adam Adams. What's up, podcaster? It's your host, Adam Adams. And we have Holly Shannon coming back to the podcast like a couple years later, hundreds of episodes ago. So she was on episode 63. And I'm going to make sure that episode 63 is linked into the show notes. So you go ahead and scroll down if you'd like to check it out. We back then we talked about why do you need to frame and structure your podcast? Like why you have to make sure that there is good structure on your show and and we teach you how to do that. Julie, Holly teaches you how to do that. I mentioned to Holly a moment ago. I said I've got this other friend who Julie Holly who's also been on the show a lot of times. And then it's Holly Shannon. I'm like two first names, two first names. Just make sure you tell me if I mess this up and then I go and mess it up right after. <laughs> so the podcast is called Coffee Culture. So scroll down, you can connect with her, you can see her podcast. And today, what are we talking about today, Holly? We're talking about rebranding in the niche today. Okay. So did you rebrand? Because I could have sworn that back then it was already coffee culture. No. So my show has gone through a few iterations, um, which is why I'm an advocate of it because it worked for me. And I'll explain that a little bit. So the show was born in season one as a culture factor. Okay. And it was a conversation about company culture from the C-suite during COVID because the show launched in April 2020 and every business, no matter what it was from Fortune 100 to mom and pop struggled with company culture. So it started off with that. Season two, I called it Culture Factor 2.0. And we started to talk to emerging leaders that were coming out from this whole pandemic and were kind of shifting the narrative about how companies are led and what company culture looks like. Season three, um, I noticed a lot of people from the great resignation falling out and a lot of creator economy was born. There was always a freelance in the gig economy, but now it became the creator economy. So season three was Culture Factor, and I decided to dive into the conversation at that point in time, which was blockchain, NFTs, and cryptocurrency, because there was such a huge shift, just like we're seeing with AI now. That was a huge shift then. And then season four, I interviewed people live in New York at a conference that I was speaking at. So Every season, it's taken on a different flavor. And then my final season that ended in May, I switched to coffee culture because the common thread that I had seen was that we were all seeking connection and we use coffee as a guise to connect, uh, whether that's networking at a cafe, going on a first date, or just to help a friend out. So my show has been rebranded over five seasons and I've been able to maintain my global rank. And so that's what I'm here to talk about today. I will let you know, Holly, I almost did it again. That's so embarrassing. Don't worry. So good. embarrassing. I'm dyslexic. I got to let the listener know. But here's the thing. I didn't expect you to have five different iterations. So A, I didn't expect so much. And I was taking best notes I could. B, I'm curious if you made a mistake or two, because one of the times you were talking about creativity, but you said that the name was Culture Factor, and I just want to ask in a second. And then I missed number four. So let me start okay. here by just making sure I know what number four was. The fourth iteration, Culture Factor was number one. Mm -hmm. Culture Factor 2.0 is number two. Mm -hmm. You said out loud that not season three went back to Culture Factor. But I was curious if you meant that it was creative factor or something like that. No, nope, no. Nope. It always maintained as culture factor in some way from season one 
through four. Okay, so season season four is Culture Factor? Yep, it's always been that. And then season five was the only time I really shifted it and called it Coffee Culture. Okay, and what was Culture Factor, the fourth version, what was that supposed to be about? Just so I at least have the information. Of course. So I was invited to speak at NFT NYC And I thought it would be an interesting exercise to interview artists, collectors, and businesses supporting that ecosystem Uh, of blockchain and NFTs live. And so I so so number three was number three was blockchain and AI, and then number four was NFTs and things around that. Is that right? Close. So season three was an education in blockchain NFTs and so forth. And I'm sorry if I made it confusing. Um, I wanted a very simple education for people because it was all new terminology. Everybody was talking about Web3 technology, but nobody really knew what any of it meant. So season three of Culture Factor was breaking down all of those difficult new terms in a very simplistic way. And then season four became more conversation about the people in that ecosystem that were creating art and businesses around that. Okay. Sorry if I made that confusing. No, 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 no. It's all me. It's all me. So here's a question. I'm hoping that it is obvious to some people and other people are like, well, that's a good question. So why would you go from culture factor, culture factor, culture factor, culture factor, and then switch it to coffee culture? And I heard you say that, you know, coffee is how we connect. It's all about connection. But What I'm curious about is, do you think that people who are looking for a podcast about coffee now are more likely to listen to your fifth season than they would your right avatar like from seasons one through four? So that is a multifaceted and good question. So I want to make sure I answer this, all of it. So I am a diverse individual. I have a lot of ideas and passions and things that I find very interesting. And I think you're one of those people, and I'm sure your listeners are that type of person. And frankly, in April of 2020, you know, company culture and the state of the economy and how the pandemic was affecting how we work was a really important topic. It's not so much now. People don't want to have that same conversation now. When I was having the conversation about NFTs and blockchain, it was all over the internet. It was the culture. It was the conversation. And so I did my best to educate myself and other people on what that was all about in the moment. So we are diverse people, and there is a very big chance that anybody who was listening to Holly Shannon in season one might have been part of my community because company culture was an interesting topic for them. Maybe I was tapping into HR professionals or CMOs or whatever. And it's quite likely that those same people did not come along for the ride when I hit season five and I was talking about you know coffee and connection and all of that. But I think that podcasts that evolve, like you evolve, like I evolve, makes sense if people enjoy who you are, your way of thinking, and how you bridge each season. I can't change the fact that I am a multifaceted person. I never did just study one thing and stay on that track. It's not who I am. I was in boutique hospitality in the event space for many years. I had my own jewelry business for many years, and then I was in podcast and marketing. They couldn't be more different. And I think a lot of people out there have zigged and zagged in their entrepreneurial career. So yes, it was a gamble to shift the name and to shift the niche. And yes, it was not probably talking to the same avatar. But interestingly, I was able to maintain my global rank throughout it. So I think that There are more people out there that are interested in a diversity of topics than you drilling down on just that one niche all the time. I think there's some of us that exist out there (laughs) that are moving with culture. What's happening in the zeitgeist? I want to know. That's just who I am. I want to talk about your business and who you serve. Because you mentioned that each season, in a way, changes the avatar. It changes the content. It changes 
what you're curious about. And in some cases, one avatar versus a different avatar who's interested in something else like NFTs or whatever it is. So if we could just talk about like the strategy behind the podcast, whether it's personal brand, whether it's interviewing your best client, whether it's getting people to hire you for a certain thing, what is your business? Who do you serve? Well, I think what's so great about podcasts is you can make it be any of those things. And I'm sure with your work, you find that you get clients or you cultivate clients through podcasts. For me, I think what people have taken away is that I think my sweet spot is business strategy. And when I talk to people and I talk about how business works or how people are struggling with what their next phase is with their business, I feel as though my conversations and interviews tap into that. And it's what I have found organically people have reached out to me for. And when I say business strategy, if can we're I, talking- Can I interrupt and, and yeah. back you up real quick? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In your business, who do you serve? Like we can talk about the podcast here in just a second, like how do they fit together? But sure. I do definitely want to at least start with that knowledge of what is your business? Who do you serve? I think my business is focused at the small business owner. Okay. Um, I don't work with enterprise. Um, I work with the entrepreneur and the small businesses, startups, founders. And it could be twofold. It could be that their business strategy, you know, when you're in a startup environment or a small business, it's usually all hands on deck and everybody does a little of everything. And your mission starts off in one direction. And very often, just to keep the wheels on the bus, everybody does a lot of things and you lose your way a little. So I think my strength is coming in and helping people get sort of the wheels back on the bus in the right direction. In terms of podcasting, I've had people come to me as business strategy. How do I align my podcast to best serve me? Because as you know, some people get into podcasting to cultivate partnerships and other businesses. Okay. Well, with that said, and you help other people to be able to align their podcast, their business, their strategy, their message. How do you align your own basically podcast to serve your business? In what ways are you doing that? That's a tough question because mine was built initially as a poll marketing tool to enable sales and bring leads to a website that business was alongside another person and they were unsuccessful with their business. So I took the podcast and left with it. So the original intent of that podcast was what a lot of people create a podcast for, at least a business podcast, and that's to support their business, to bring warm leads to their website and to cultivate business that way. A strategist, I recognize that a podcast can be built to do that, but a podcast could also be built to create partnerships with people that you'd like to do business with, all right? Partner with, not just I work for you and then leave, but now let's create something together like a old school joint venture, right? For some people, they want a podcast that they can be seen as the thought leader that they feel that they are or that their business possesses with the leadership that lives there. So my job is to understand what is the goal? Is the goal leads? Is the goal to be on stage? Or is the goal to find partners and brands to do business with? And in creating seasons that reflect that goal, is how you get from point A to point B, right? With any business. So you can build the tool, you just want to build it right. And that's my strategy. I might be projecting and I'm really trying to ask, do you get more value by having those conversations with the guests on your podcast because you could potentially work with them? Do you get more value out of those conversations and the networking than you do care about or get value from dozens or hundreds or millions of listeners? So I don't actually cultivate my interviews to become my business. 
I am just insanely curious and I love podcasting as a medium. I think maybe people who listen to the podcast might see value in what I could bring to their company or how I can assist them in strategy work. So yeah, that's how I would cool. answer that. And on your podcast, when I look at it, I haven't listened in a while, Holly. I haven't listened in a while. I, I listened a lot when we first got connected, but it's been a little bit. And I wanted to ask you, is it all solos? Is it all interviews? Is it a combination of both? It looks like all interviews, but that's why I asked the question. So seasons one through four were all interviews. Season five was a departure. And what I did is I interviewed people and I did some solo in between. The solo pieces I called my espresso shots. So it was just fun little facts about coffee and coffee culture. Um, and then I interspersed it with different interviews, a variety of people that I just found super interesting that I learned about and felt like the world needed to hear their story. So I think I'm probably just mad that way. <laughs> <laughs> is there a season six that you're already trying to create? Oh, Adam, that is like the million dollar question for Holly Shannon. I am really struggling with that right now. Season five was definitely a departure for culture factor. Uh, it was an interesting one. I landed an interview with a couple of people I hadn't anticipated to say yes. And it turned out to be a very special season for me for a career high for me personally because I only got into this in April of 2020. And my last interview was the end of May with Seth Godin. And I've been sitting still since then. I decided that my naturally impulsive manner, like I get ideas and I run towards them, I decided to take a different approach and to sort of sit back and wait. I have not had any epiphanies or moments that say, here's your season six. So I've been holding off. I haven't podcasted since the end of May. It's very, very weird. It's a strange sensation. I'm not sure what season six looks like. And if you or any of your listeners have an idea about what I should be talking about, please, by all means, send me a message. But I'm not sure what season six is. Got it. Well, yeah, it looks like when I look at the ratings and reviews, most of them came out like more than a year ago. And then there was one that came out in June. So just like a couple of weeks after you published the one with Seth Godin, it's in a different language. So I can't tell I know. what they're saying. I, I, I can't translated tell what it. They, I'm like, what is this? Like German or do no, you know what language it is? I have some very high ratings in different countries. So I'm assuming, but hold on. That's okay. so funny that you say that because what we could do is we could Google translate it. Wouldn't that be kind of a funny thing to do? Yeah, like, I do. How I work. I'm used to doing a little bit of Google translating, but while we're working on that, I had a couple of other things that I wanted to mention or ask. Yes, And absolutely. You know, the three that I had queued up already. So the first one was, what's your business? Who do you serve? And then kind of figuring out how it aligns. The second one, I was going to ask about NPR, then third, Seth Godin, then fourth, Global Ranking. So I've got a couple of things queued up. Yeah, go And for it. I think the NPR... This is a yes or no question. It is not an explain this to me yet question because I just want to hear yes or no. Were you on NPR? No. You weren't. Okay. All right. I read your bio and I was like, oh, cool. I must have skimmed it. I was like, she was on NPR. How did she do that? Let me then, we'll skip that question. We'll just go to how did you get Seth Godin? And then you, we'll talk about global ranks and if it's important, but after these messages. Hey, my friend, as you know, this episode is sponsored by my company, growyourshow.com. We want you to be able to have the best tools at your disposal without costing you a whole arm and a leg. So right now you can get a free list of vetted equipment that like mics, mixers, webcams, sound treatment, editing software, everything that you need. I created the whole PDF with direct purchase links just to save you time and money to help it be more convenient for you. So this free PDF will help you skip all the guesswork. If it's on there, it's vetted and approved by yours truly. And if it's not on there, it's probably not worth the money. So go ahead and get yours at growyourshow.com forward slash PDF. Let's get back into the show. Before we jumped into the break, we talked about NPR, which I was like, did I read that she was on it? But we'll get the real story here in a second. We're going to move fast through NPR, through Seth Godin, through Global Ranking. 
And then we'll finish by talking about rebranding. Well, like we've already mentioned how Holly has rebranded a few times. So where I want to go is what are the takeaways? If you are thinking about rebranding, if you want to rebrand, what do you need to do in order to do it successfully? So let's just go start with the NPR part. So it was really, as I look at the bio again, you mentored a few students and one of them ended up going on to work at NPR. Can you tell just a little bit more about that story, how it worked and everything? Sure, sure. So I was speaking in Austin at South by Southwest and I ended up mentoring somebody there and asked her if she wanted to come work for me. She was working in sound engineer work and I thought it would be advantageous for her to look under the hood of a podcast. So I brought her in and I gave her the ability to pick different facets of the show and what inspired her. Was it the journalism and research side of it? Was it SEO? Was it putting it on the host site? Like what things did she want to do? So we gave her a flavor of the show and different things. And she ended up helping to produce season three. And then in season four, she had an idea around how she wanted to produce that with the live interviewing I was doing in New York. And so she created a story arc through that whole season and it was of her own design and I gave her full credit for that. And this became part of her portfolio and she went on to land a job at NPR. I was really happy for her. I know maybe I had like a little part in it, but you know, definitely she was a rock star and had all of the skills to get it herself. But I think maybe coming under a podcast was something that maybe helped her to formulate what she was looking for. Yeah. Well, the next thing that I was really curious about is you had Seth Godin, which actually you brought up as well. I was already going to want to ask you. He is an author and I've actually read at least one of his books. Uh, This is marketing. And I think I've read... I'm looking at all the books. I don't recognize another one, but I could have sworn I read two, but This Is Marketing was a pretty pretty good book. And I mean, he sells millions of copies. And so the thought that I'm having right now is a lot of the times my listener, people that work with me, I help podcasters, people that work with us, one of the big fears that they generally have is nobody's ever going to want to come onto my podcast. I don't know how to ask. Maybe I need to start with just friends and family. Maybe I just need to do solo episodes. And I think like people seem to be concerned about reaching out or even knowing how to find somebody like Seth Godin, you know, an author. So I'm curious, kind of, if you don't mind sharing the story with tangible takeaways, like how could we implement a similar thing to be able to get somebody that's well known on our show? What kind of were the steps or what would be some takeaways that we could do? So, Let me start by saying you don't throw spaghetti at the wall. And a lot of people think like if I just splatter out a ton of emails, I use some sort of navigation system through LinkedIn to DM a bunch of people or I do an email campaign and I'm just going to do that. It doesn't serve you well. I mean, how many emails do you delete on a daily basis or throw into junk because you receive the same thing? You have to do your due diligence, and especially if it's somebody influential like a Seth Godin, you have to do the work. In my particular case, um, I had read This Is Marketing, just like you. It changed the trajectory of my show. It changed the trajectory in season two for me, and I wrote him after I was done reading it, and I explained to him about my show and how pivotal his conversation was in that book for me. And so I was acknowledging his book. I was acknowledging how it affected my work. I was thanking him for what he did. And this was the email essentially. And I asked him to come on and he replied and said, no. So very often that's going to happen. But his reply was, I can't, I'm busy. I'm sorry. No, but I'm rooting for you. And so I waited and I waited and when I was getting to season five, I felt more confident and I felt that it was worth reaching out again. So that's a big time change. You know, that's a couple of years right there that I reached out again and said, Hey, you know, I would really love to have you on. I explained to him again that helped me shift my show. 
And I was really interested in having him on. And so perseverance does pay off. I didn't clobber him. I didn't email him on a monthly basis. Perseverance is one thing, but doing it right is another. So you have to have a strategy about how you're going to go about things. For me, I loved his work. I listened to his podcast. I read his books. I listened to his lectures. So I was able to write something thoughtful. You can't do that for everybody. But if you're trying to create a podcast that's meaningful and you want to curate who you're going to come on, have on, then you have to do the work. You have to research them. You have to spend time getting into their head a little bit and appeal to them the right way. Yeah. I call it play to the player sometimes. Mm. Play to the player. Me, yes. me and the boys, I have two sons. We play apples to apples. And then sometimes with friends, I'll play cards against humanity. They're basically the same game, just one of them's more adult and the other one's more family oriented. But when you're playing that, you play the card that you think that person will pick. You don't only just pick the best card or the card that you think, but oftentimes, like for example, my sons both are doing percussion. They're drummers. They have drum sets and other things like that. And so if there was a question that was like, what is music to your ears? I could put mountain biking because I love mountain biking, or I could put Mozart if I wanted. Or if I had a card that was like drums and it was their turn, I wouldn't play those other two cards. I'd play to the player. And so I love exactly. how you do that and you, how you did that with Seth. And I have just one question that I'm not sure if you went into enough detail for the listener to be able to like do the thing. And so you mentioned that you read the book, you followed him, you absorbed content, and then, quote, I wrote him. I wrote to him. I wrote him. But I'm thinking, like, how did you write him? Where did you write him? I understand that you gave the takeaways, you talked about the show and all of that, but how did you even find him? Text message come through, or what did you find? <laughs> so this is kind of funny for him. I actually just started throwing out different emails that I thought might be his. Uh, oh. I, I played around. However, however, after listening to his podcast numerous times, I learned later on that he had his email. It was kind of buried in his website, but I actually did find it afterwards. But when I first sent the email, I just took a chance because I wasn't listening to his podcast the first time I reached out to him. I reached out to him because I had read his book and I was following other content. I actually started following his podcast later on. So I took a chance, but there are actually services and I never remember the name of it. I always have to send him text my son. What was the name of that website that helps you find famous people's email? So to that end, I did use that service once and I found Mark Cuban's email, and I did email him and ask him to come on because I had spoken to him for like a solid 10 minutes at a conference and we had our picture taken together and everything. So I reached out and he kindly responded, no, also. So you never know. Maybe I just have to wait two more years. <laughs> yeah, I bet you will wait two more years and you'll be inspired for season six or season seven <laughs> or season eight at that time. Absolutely. Good stuff. All right. We've got a lot to move through. Okay. We talked about NPR. We talked about the Seth Godin. Give us a quick answer on why you mention your global rank. Do you think the global rank is important? Does it serve you? And if you know any way to affect to get ranked higher for the listener, will you share that? So just talk to us about global ranking because I think you said it's in your bio, which the listener can just scroll down and check it out. It's in your bio already. And you mentioned that between a couple of seasons, like you were able to maintain your global ranking earlier, you mentioned. And so I'm just curious, how important is it? And is there anything you know that can affect it? So why it might be important is maybe a little bit more personalized. If you would like to land influential or celebrity clients, having a high global rank might help you in the email request that you send to them. Hi, I'm ranked whatever, and I'm listened to in over 100 countries. And you know, some of the stats you have about your show will help in your email because it'll show that you have been at it for a while. You know, it's not like you just started the show and they're going to be interview number 10. It shows that you've put some time in, you've built a community, you made a global rank, you're heard in other countries. It does uh, hold weight to people who are interested in coming on. 
or to keep their attention. I would also say it helps if you want to speak, if you see yourself as moving from the microphone and the podcast in your kitchen, like I'm in right now, to the stage, having a podcast that's got some street credibility to it makes it a more interesting prospect for the trade show or convention or conference that's interested in bringing you on to speak. So it's only as important as it is for your journey. If your journey is to cultivate business and you're using your podcast as a pull marketing tool to get some warm sales leads, it may not matter. It sort of depends on what your end game is. And so, and the second part of the question, is there anything you can do to affect it? You know, I'm going to be honest. I played around quite a bit in changing the different topics that my podcast fell into. There are some topics that a lot of podcasts land in. So let's say, for example, your podcast is on true crime or is, let me make this easier. Your podcast is on life insurance, all right? When you have to choose on your podcast hosting site, the three subcategories that it falls under, your first and one And sometimes is you can only get two. It depends on the platform. That's true. Uh, Very yeah. true. I use Simplecast and I have three. So yeah. everybody's is different. Let's just say there's two. So right away, you're going to say, oh, you know, business. And maybe the subcategory is going to be services. Okay. Maybe the second one is going to be entrepreneurship because maybe it's a company business or something like that. So those are probably very heavily traveled sections. So think of all of the podcasts out there, all the big business ones that are out there that like Morning Brew puts out or just big names like your John Lee Dumas, for example, they're probably going to be under there. So they're going to dominate that space. So you also have to think about what you're talking about. And for me, I kind of played around with those categories a little bit. And sometimes I saw better strength in cultivating an audience because people do Google searches on lots of things. And sometimes they don't just say business, right? They don't just say business of whatever. Maybe it's how do I do this? Maybe it's the how-to of something versus the service. So it's just kind of playing around with that a little bit. And I think that personally helped me navigate the ranks a little bit. Cool. I like that. How about going to rebranding? You already mentioned that you rebranded. So you've talked to us a little bit about all of the different ways, times that you've rebranded. And what I'd like to do is for the listener who wants to rebrand, Give us the best takeaways to be successful with a rebrand. Okay. So I think this is an important piece for people. When we start podcasting, the one lesson that we are taught from the beginning is you have to niche down the smallest viable audience, right? And that makes a lot of sense. Find your avatar. What's your niche? Drill down. Talk about that and talk about it a lot and talk about it well. And that is a really good strategy. But what that doesn't take into account is that, like in my case, culture changes, right? What people want to focus on changes. And I think that what I learned is that it's okay to rebrand. It's okay to slightly adjust your topic if you need to. One thing I would point out, and Adam, I think you would probably be a big advocate of this. One of the things that you teach people that are coming into your company to have a podcast is you have to be passionate about what you're talking about. You have to believe in it. You need to be passionate about it. And with that, you're going to do really well. But people, you know, their passion wanes, right? So for me, I got tired of the conversation around company culture. Could I have continued? Absolutely. Could I have faked that? Yeah, I probably could have. But would I have loved the content? Would I have enjoyed the conversation and dug deeper? Maybe not. So my answer is rebranding and really looking at your niche and how it's serving you is important because even your business might evolve over the years. So there, your podcast might need to evolve. So I don't think it's bad to rebrand. 
And I don't think it's bad to look at your strategy and what your niche is along the way and make sure you're still on target. Yeah, good stuff. I'm interested about that. So your couple things that I heard you say is, you know, culture changes, focus can change, giving permission to the listener who's a podcaster, it's okay to rebrand. And mentioning that, you know, being passionate about something can support your drive to making it happen. So you're instead of swimming upstream, now you're still swimming, but it just has a little bit of resistance. You're now able to swim downstream by having it something that you're passionate about because the fire gets fueled um, much easier if it's something that you care about and it's not like pulling teeth. It's not feeling like work or a job. So that's all very interesting. You mentioned that your business can evolve and so can your podcast. Let's just ask when rebranding, what are some of the considerations? What are some of the things that need to happen when we rebrand our show from one name to a different name? So I think that for me, the way that I did it was I paid attention to my trailer. I would reissue a trailer to introduce a new season and some of the changes that I was going through. My listeners were cultivated through LinkedIn and Instagram. So I started to talk about on there and do posts that were relevant to some of the changes that I was making and to get feedback. But I think you don't want to just, you know, surprise, you know, open the box on your new season and have it be completely different because then your loyal listeners won't understand and they'll maybe feel a little betrayed. I think actually communicating with them and inviting them into that conversation is always good. You don't have to take their advice, right? You don't have to, but inviting them in and saying, hey, everyone, go listen to my trailer. Uh, My show is taking a turn. I'm really excited about it. This is the topic I'm talking about. I'd love for you to come along for the ride. I'd love for you to share it. And I'd love your opinion on it. DM me if you have any thoughts on it. I hope you'll give it a listen. So It's important to inform people in whatever methods suit you. Definitely, I would update your trailer to reflect what you're doing. So if anybody stumbles, even stumbles on your show, they know the direction you're going. So I would start there. And then I would share your passion, whatever social media platforms you feel like, so that your audience, your community can sort of come along for the ride and feed off of your enthusiasm. Okay. So I've gotten a couple of things here. What do you need to do in order to rebrand a show? And the takeaways that I have heard you say, there's a couple. One is the trailer. One is communicating with the listener. And one is social media sharing with your people. What should we consider if we are rebranding a show, not just having a new season, but actually like you did for between season four and season five, when it's a full you know, rebrand with a new name and new artwork and stuff. What do we think about for the artwork and for the music and maybe for intro and outro? Do those things need to be looked at or not? Absolutely. That's a really super question, actually. So thanks for bringing it up. So I try to carry a through line in all of my artwork from the beginning in terms of colors, fonts, the word culture was constantly threaded through all of them. So in terms of the visuals, I did try to keep some identity from season one to season five. So it didn't, it wasn't like an abrupt look to the eye if some, if the new artwork popped up for my loyal listeners. The name, I kept a little bit of a through line on there, always incorporating the word culture in there. And I think that is important so that people don't feel like you just like slammed into them. So I'd say some of the brand identity pieces, it's important to see if you can keep a little bit of a feel that would resonate and be that recall. So artwork, did you change your music? Actually, I did change the music every season. That was, I'm sorry, you did ask that about intro and outro. I did change the music. I had music that I was using in season one that I got for free on GarageBand. And season two, I met somebody on Clubhouse and I just thought he was amazing. And I asked him if he would want to do my music for season two. He went back and listened to the free track. You know, he went back and listened and he reinterpreted it 
with his flamenco guitar. So it was had a little bit of the feel. And then I'd say season three, four and five were also different because the sound engineer that I was working with wanted to play and put her fingerprint a little bit on the seasons that she was helping to produce. So I gave her the bandwidth to do that because again, that was part of her growth. And I didn't think it would steer anybody away. And yeah, so I changed it from season to season. Probably the only real through line was season one to season two. The rest was maybe going to be considered hodgepodge, but I liked it. <laughs> good, good. Well, just as a reminder, Holly Shannon, this is her second time, I think second, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Second time on the show. And the first one was episode 63. So today we talked about a lot. I mean, it mainly we talked about rebranding your show, that you have permission to rebrand your show, how to think about the intro, the outro, the music, the artwork, the trailer, updating the trailer, going on social media, sharing your passion, that it's okay to change the podcast because sometimes your business changes a little bit. We got a whole bunch of other information like how Holly like did season one, 2.0, the blockchain, then I don't even remember what they're called, NFTs, and then moved to coffee culture. And if you want to check out the previous episode back at 63, the link's in the show notes. And it says, why do you need to frame and structure your show? So just talking about outlining how the show is going to work and allowing you to be better at it. So that's where you would find that. And also you can get to Coffee Culture. The link is in the show notes, easy to find. And the next episode is a little bit shorter episode. I like it when you check out this episode and the shorter episode because you got plenty of time to do both. And so I will see you on the next episode. It's a solo episode and I'm going to be pouring in to you. If you're glad that you checked out the podcast today, if you got some value out of this episode, some actionable takeaways, I invite you to do one of three things. A, you could do a written review on Apple. Let us know what you think. Just an honest written review. B, you could share the podcast with a friend of yours who needs it. Or C, at the very least, implement what you've learned to take your business and your podcast to the next level. And I'll see you on the next episode.